Welcome back to another jam-packed edition of the Interlake Sports Now. I'm Josh Dugan, and right now, as far as sports in the Valley and beyond go, this is about as good as it gets. This week, we're going to look at some Grizz and Cats. We're going to talk with the Daily Interlake's Fritz Neighbor about some Grizzlies, Bobcats, and the Big Sky in general right now. And, of course, we're going to dive into an action-packed week of sports in the Valley and surrounding areas, like I said. We got playoffs going on. We got state title action going on. A lot going on in various sports, and we're going to get into it all. Before we get to that, reminder, today's episode is brought to you by Nomad. Voted the Flathead's best manufacturer. Nomad is a longtime supporter of the local community and sports scene, celebrating 20 years of building great careers and mission-focused custom vehicles. Nomad, a Montana-based company making a global impact. Visit www.nomadgcs.com for more information. That's www.nomadgcs.com. Quick reminder, you can subscribe to the Daily Interlake E-Edition to get all your local news right at your fingertips. Check out thedailyinterlake.com for more information. All right, let's get it rocking and rolling. I can't talk how much about it. it's a jam-packed week and then not get into it, so let's do it right now. First off, we have two local soccer teams state title bound. That's impressive. Let's start off with the Whitefish Girls soccer team. This excerpt is from the Daily Interlake, and you can read the full recap on the dailyinterlake.com. The Whitefish Bulldogs are headed to their second state title game in three years. So, hey, two out of three, not bad. After a 5-3 overtime victory over the Hamilton Bulldogs in a State A semifinal game Saturday, here's a quote from Whitefish coach Roland Benedict. Quote, we played well. Credit to Hamilton. They came out and they were set up in a certain way to attack us and prevent us from scoring, and they did a good job. End quote. It was the second time Whitefish has had, Whitefish has had a game decided in overtime this postseason. Last week, the Bulldogs beat defending champ Laurel in a penalty kicks overtime. So, Whitefish, they've had some postseason play. They overcame that. They make the state title game. They got that coming up soon. That's exciting. So keep it going here. Whitefish led 3-0 before Hamilton tied things up in the second half and forced the extra frame. Here's another quote from Benedict. We took control and unfortunately got a little complacent in the second half and allowed them to get back in, the, back in it and tie the game, Benedict said. They scored on a great set piece and a free kick and a one-touch laser beam from 30 yards out. But in the overtime period, it was 2-0, super comprehensive. We took care of of business. Benedict thought the cold, wet weather did cause some adversity, which is something to look forward to moving ahead towards the state title game because there could be snow on the way. So soccer in the snow, definitely a, a tough game to play in those conditions. Here's what Benedict had to say. We missed a lot of chances like... Our expected goals for the game, our XG was almost seven, and theirs was just under three. It's a high-scoring game, and wet ball's tough to deal with, but it was entertaining, that's for sure, which we've done all year. Whitefish will play host to Billing Central in the state final this weekend. Our next local team in the state soccer title action is going to be the Columbia Falls Boys Soccer Squad. Very impressive for the Wildcats. This write-up was from Daily Interlake Sports Editor Katie Brown, who was in attendance for the Wildcats' playoff game that got them to the state title action. Here we go. Last year, the Columbia Falls Wildcats had to go through Missoula, Loyola, en route to the State A Boys Soccer Final. It was the same story this year, and the Wildcats are headed to the chipper after a 2-0 semifinal win over the Rams on Saturday at Flip Darley Memorial Field. It's the third straight year the Wildcats will play in a state final game. In the first half, you could cut the tension with a knife in this one. Even after sophomore River Wolford buried a rebound kick from the corner, the Wildcats knew they still had more battles to win. Here's a quote from Wildcats coach O'Brien Bird. It's just this pressure of being number one. And so when we scored that first goal, I don't even know if I celebrated. It was just like I knew we were still in it for the long haul. But Kai Golan added the dagger in the 69th minute, a beauty of a goal, perfectly angled from the left wing. Here's some more quotes from Coach Bird on the Wildcats' performance and Kai Golan. Kai, when he wants to, he can turn it on and nobody can stop him. That was just a goal out of sheer will and determination. Super proud of the boys. They made it, and now we're going to host the state championship, which was our dream. Columbia Falls will play host to the Livingston Rangers in the state championship game. The Rangers do have some momentum going as they just 
knocked off Whitefish in the semifinal game. As we know, Whitefish was coming off four states, four straight state title championships. So it's going to be a good game for Columbia Falls. Looking forward to see how that one goes. Local squad, though, they made it. They're in the state title game. They're undefeated. Very impressive. One last headline from this week, some more state title action. It's one of those weeks. So we had state cross-country championships. They took place in Missoula. You could check out the full recap on the Sunday, October 23rd version of the Daily Interlake. The Whitefish Boys cross-country team ran down a landmark trophy at the state cross-country championships, but it was a little hard to tell. After posing for a handful of photos with their second-place hardware inside the awards pen at the University of Montana golf course, the Bulldogs quickly exited. We were looking to win it, said Captain Nate Inglefinger, a senior. The title went to Livingston, which scored 78 points behind three runners in the top 15. The Flathead Valley was well represented in the meet with the Columbia Falls girls following up their state 2021 a title with a third place finish. Flatheads girls vied for a trophy but ended up fourth. Junior Bravette Lily Rumsey East finished, fi- finished fifth, the highest of all Valley runners. All right. So the Valley was well represented, had a lot of good track action. So we're going to get a little bit more to that later. But quick reminder make sure you're following the Daily Interlake on Twitter. That's at Daily Interlake on Twitter to keep up with the latest breaking news in the Valley and beyond. Also, you can follow yours truly on Twitter at jdugan406 for local coverage and more. All right, let's dive into the rest of the prep roundup from a jam-packed week. Let's start out a little more soccer playoff action. The Flathead Bravettes fell to Sentinel 3-0 in girls' state AA soccer action in the first round Tuesday in Missoula. The Bravettes did sneak into the playoffs with the win over Crosstown rival Glacier. So, you know, there was a lot to be proud of, and they could take that to hang their hat on moving forward. Moving to the boys. We had some Crosstown playoff action. Speaking of that, the boys met as well with Glacier and Flathead. Boys soccer teams meeting up in Tuesday's Double A Western playoff match with a trip to the quarterfinal on the line. The game was scoreless for the first 38 minutes, but after that, Glacier found its groove scoring four unanswered goals to take home the W. The Wolfpack was led by two goals from Liam Ells and a shutout performance by Glacier goalie Dylan Hawley. The Wolfpack traveled to Billings Friday in their quarterfinal matchup, but they did fall 3-2 to two to Billings. Here's some words from Glacier head coach Ryan Billiot on his squad. Quote, we played our best match of the season when it mattered most. It was just encouraging to see the guys come off the bus and a long road trip and really come to play and played fantastically, to be honest. I'm really proud of the character that they showed and you hope that they play their best at the end of the season when it matters most, and they certainly did. So, end quote there. Look, you beat your crosstown rival the notch in a playoff in the playoffs, excuse me, to make it to the next round. You travel to Billings, you put on a great effort. I could definitely see why their head coach was proud. Let's keep it moving. Columbia Falls, the girls' soccer team, we mentioned the boys earlier, their state title bound. The girls unfortunately fell just short, falling to Billings Central in the state A semifinal last Saturday. They fell 4-3 to to the Rams, and here's what Wildcats coach Thomas Clark had to say of his team's effort. Quote, after going down 3-0, to zero, from then on out, the girls started fighting. We gave ourselves a shot and fought like hell and made it a game where you could walk away with your he- heads held high. I think Billings is the best team in the state of Montana, and I wouldn't be surprised – I, and I wouldn't be surprised if they don't go out there and win the whole thing this year. Huge, huge credit to our seniors and our leaders as a whole, Clark added. Zoe Bird played a hell of a game and goal. City Man scored a goal. And our other captains, Josie Harris and Hope McAtee, each scored two. When your leaders all go out there and show that kind of grit, it tells you a lot about the character of your team. End quote. Billing Central was the runner-up last year to Laurel. And this time they'll move on to the state title game versus the Valley's very own Whitefish Bulldogs. We'll see how that one goes. We'll update that next week. So, getting into the world of prep football action, but first, a words from our friends at Nomad. At Nomad, the key to our success has always been the amazing talent experience of our team. Based in one of the most beautiful places on earth, our Kalispell, Montana headquarters is home to some of the most skilled engineers, integrators, software developers, welders, electricians, carpenters, mechanics, and professional staff in the market. Our team is dedicated to working collaboratively with our value clients to ensure success in every mission. Join our team. Check out our careers page at nomadgcs.com careers to view current job openings and submit an application. Go check that out. Shout out to good people at Nomad for helping make this show happen. All right, keeping it moving. 
Remember, you can always check out the full recaps, typically in the Sunday edition of the Daily Interlake when it comes to our prep football action. And right now, there is a lot of it going on, especially with the playoffs on the horizon. But let's get in to the end of the regular season this week. Let's start it out with Whitefish at Polson. In my opinion, this was the game of the week. Two great quarterbacks, two playoff-bound teams. Here we go. Polson's Jarrett Wilson. Packed a lot of football into the first half Friday, and Whitefish quarterback Finn Ridgeway had the goods in the second. At the end, a low snap ended a Whitefish drive at Polson's four-yard line, and the host Pirates held off the Bulldogs 34-27 in a Western A showdown. Wilson helped the Pirates to a 34-13 halftime lead, first with a seven-yard scoring run, and then with four touchdown passes. The senior QB ran his season touchdown total to 31, with strikes to Tyler Wenderoth, Dawson Dumont, Tommy Sherry, and Trent Wilson. Whitefish wasn't done, though. Getting a two-yard run from Ridgeway at 524 in the third quarter, then a 55-yard catch and run from Ryder Baranowski on the first play of the fourth. Now it was 34-27 when Polson gained just one first down in two fourth-quarter possessions. The Bulldogs had their chances. They punted once but got the ball back at their 44 and drove to the Pirate 13. The key play being a 31-yard pass from Ridgeway to Baranowski. Ridgeway ran the ball with, to the five with under a minute left, but... Polson's defense stood strong. Even after a pass interference, put the, pi- put the ball at the Pirates' three-yard line. Fourth and one, 16 seconds left. The ensuing snap got away, and Polson recovers to seal the game. Two very impressive quarterbacks. Ridgeway was 14 for 24 for 188 yards passing with one interception. Ran the ball 22 times for 147 yards, putting him at 1,144 rushing yards on the season. Jarrett Wilson kept on doing his things. He was 15 for 25 passing, 196 yards, had the touchdown passes, and tacked on the other on the ground. So, I mean, when you add, and plus he had 118 yards rushing on 17 carries. So, pretty much to, to sum it up, that was a heck of a ball game. Playoff bound teams, the Pirates, they got the bye. They don't have a game next week. They're going to be waiting to see who they take on. And Whitefish is the number five seed in the A playoffs. They're going to be traveling to Havre to take on the number four seed. So, heck of a heck of a game to get us going. Let's keep it moving. Glacier, this one wasn't quite as close. Okay, Glacier beat Hellgate 84-15 to Thursday night. So, that kind of sums it up right there. Gage Slider had five touchdown passes in the game. And, I mean, it was just one of those games. The Wolfpack offense rolled 672, 672 yards of total offense, 358 of those coming on the ground. Jackson Henley had a, Hensley excuse me, had 138 rushing yards on 10 carries. He had multiple touchdown runs and caught a scoring strike. Here's a quote from Glazer head coach Grady Bennett. I'm proud of the kids for en- earning that home game, that fourth seed. Now we get to play a game with the goal of getting into the tournament. I have such a belief in this group, and we want to get in the tournament. And if we get there, we feel we can play with anyone. Slider was 16 of 26 passing for 286 yards, and he ran his season touchdown total to 34. Two scoring passes went to Bridger Smith, Cole Johnson, and Cohen Castellitz each caught one. So Glacier now, they made the playoffs they're going to host a playoff game at home. That's kind of the goal of your season. They did their job. Maybe they didn't get the bye, but they got the home game. They have Billing Senior coming out next Friday, and that's going to be a heck of a game. If Glacier can just keep it rolling offensively, they are so tough to beat, and the sky's the limit for that Wolfpack team. Let's move it on to Flathead, the other Cal Spell squad. This one's by our very own Fritz Neighbor, who was in attendance at the game. Plenty of things went right for Missoula Big Sky and the other way for Flathead Thursday night, but the key stretch came in the second quarter of what was a tie football game. Big Sky took the ball after Bro- Brody Thornsbury's 50-yard touchdown catch drew Flathead even at 7-7 and basically refused to give it back. The Eagles scored a touchdown, a field goal, a safety, and another touchdown in an eight-minute span to pretty much run away with this ball game. Flathead, though, they did have some bright spots. Nate Sconard threw for 322 yards and two scores for the Braves. He added a late 20-yard touchdown strike to Colin Leonard to cap the scoring. And he led Flathead on a sharp 86-yard drive to close the first half to end it with a Joe Jones touchdown on the ground. Other Flathead high points, a leaping grab by Gabe Sims, a nice reception by Jackson Walker, quarterback who was playing a low receiver because of an injury. And Thornsbury finished the day with 147 yards receiving. So he had a big game. The Braves overall, they gained 374 yards of total offense. They picked up 21 first downs, but ultimately turnovers and penalties played a factor with having 
10 for 93 yards total on the day. So, Flathead, they didn't get the win. They might not be playoff bound, but there's some bright spots there. You could take a lot away. Thornsberry had a heck of a game, and they're just going to keep growing from that, and that's what football is all about. Keeping it moving. Big Fork ended up handling business. They got the Western B title in the bag with a 39-0 win over Eureka. Big Fork's been a problem all year. They will, let's see, let me let me fact check. The, the Vikings will host Manhattan, the number four seed out of the South, in a first-round playoff game this Saturday. So Big Fork does not have a first-round bye. They got a playoff game coming up this Saturday. We'll definitely keep you updated there. And Eureka, whom Big Fork beat, they have a road game against Boulder. So we'll see how that one goes. We'll keep you updated on both the local squads. All right, Libby. They won this one 52 to 42 over Corvallis. We mentioned them earlier this year. Dudes a B. Cy Stevens had ran for 272 yards and four touchdowns as Libby took home the win and made the playoffs with the victory. That's Cy Stevenson. The kid's an absolute beast. I covered the game earlier this year. I think he finished with 330 rushing yards. It was around there. 337, I believe. Just absolute tank. Um on the day, he carried the ball 23 times and scored on runs of 73, 31, 59, and 9. So, pretty much it was the Cy Stevenson show. They're going to the playoffs, and they will travel to Laurel for a first-round playoff game this Saturday at 1 p.m. Last up in the prep football roundup for this week, we have the Columbia Fall Wildcats. The Wildcats, they fell to the defending state champion, Hamilton Bronx, who, you know, are a powerhouse in their own right. Undefeated record, kept that intact. Columbia Falls, though, they put up a great fight early. It was 8-7 to seven and a half. The temperature in this one was sitting in the low 40s. Rain was pouring down. As you would kind of expect, it was a grinder early. Heading into the second quarter, it was just 2-0 Hamilton. Early in the second quarter, that's when the Wildcats found some life. Cody Schweiker, quarterback, faked a handoff to his running back and found Mark Robinson wide open on a slant route over the middle for the lone Columbia Falls score of the day. From there, though, the Bronx did their thing. They started bucking. The Broncos were bucking. The Bronx, same thing. And they pretty much locked down on the defensive side of the ball. That being said, you're playing the defending state champions. It's your last regular season game. The Wildcats, they might learn a thing or two from that. That can help prepare you, make you a better team. That's just me. I think sometimes you you take a loss and you got to just kind of run with it and use it to get better. And the Wildcats, when you're playing a team who has had success in the playoffs, you know that elevates your level of play. They had that big win over Whitefish recently. The Wildcats did. I think they can get back on track. They do host a playoff game this Saturday. Miles City comes to town. I'm looking forward to the Wildcats seeing what they could do this postseason. Schweikert's a good quarterback. They got a solid squad. And I really like the way Columbia Falls plays football. They do a lot of, we're going to take what you give us. We're going to play efficient. And we're going to move the football. I, I really like the way they run the screen pass frequently. I did notice watching Hamilton's coaches on the sidelines the whole game, every play. Watch the screen. Watch the screen. So maybe other people are noticing too. But I will say I like that style of football. Play smart. Play efficient. Keep the other team's offense off the field. Let your team control the clock. And that's kind of what Columbia Falls does. And it really makes it hard for other teams to get into a rhythm when you can do it correctly. So... We'll see how they do in the playoffs and excited to see how all these local teams do in playoff action this week. I mean, we'll definitely have a lot to recap on next week's show. We got Polson, Glacier, Big Fork, Whitefish, Columbia Falls, and Libby all playoff bound. Polson's on a bye. The rest of those guys are going to be in action, and we're going to get to all of them. So that was a great prep roundup, and it's just going to be a jam-packed next week or two. I, I Hopefully, we got a next month or so, and all these teams make some runs towards that state title game. And we're like I said, we'll be checking back in on our other state title-bound soccer teams. So it's been a lot of fun. That being said, it's time for your Prep Players of the Week, presented by Hagado Media Group Montana. The team in Montana is here to help you grow. Our skilled team will assess your marketing goals and craft ROI-focused campaigns honed to meet your business needs. Our integrated marketing solutions will help your people find you wherever they are looking, whether it's Google, YouTube, apps, or the local newspaper. Contact Anton at 406-758-4410 for more information. Let's get it rock and rolling. Your prep players of the week. First off, we mentioned her a little bit earlier. We're going to get to the cross-country world. Flathead Brave Ants Jr., Lily Rumsey-Ish, came in third 
They had the third best time in all of AA and the fifth best time overall at the state cross country championships in Missoula, Saturday, October 22nd. When you can sit there and be like, you know, you're in that top tier, it's well worth celebrating. I mean, I respect all the athletes out there competing, especially in a sport like cross country. Let's be real. That is a tough sport. But, you know, we got to celebrate the success around here in our Hackadome Media Group Montana Prep Players of the Week. All right. Ish is a junior, so look for her to keep, you know, be a state championship contender once again next season. Her fifth place finish Saturday was the highest of all Valley runners in attendance. So, like I said, that is definitely well worthy of this award. Moving along, Columbia Falls Wildcats soccer. We had to pick somebody from this team. Soccer is such a group sport. It's hard to pick just one guy. But usually, this is one of the most important positions. A bit of the anchor of the team, you could say. We're going with the goalie, Bryce Dunn, Dunham. So Dunham, he had his ninth shutout of the season in the Wildcats semifinal win. That tied a school record. And he only allowed four goals all season. And all of those goals, according to... Uh, my stats here have come off three kicks or penalty kicks. So essentially when the ball's in play, Dunham is about as locked down as it gets. Super impressive. Wildcats are state title bound. And when you're playing a sport like soccer, having a guy in goal who could give you that confidence, a guy or a girl, a goalkeeper who is just going to lock it down and you have that understanding that we can go out there and play with no pressure because we know our guys got us and we don't have to worry about him, you know, letting up those early goals and then we're playing from behind. It goes a long way and you see the confidence that seems like the Wildcats play with week in and week out. Dunham definitely deserves a lot of the credit. All right, let's move it into the football world for our prep players. Polson Pirates quarterback, Jarrett Wilson. He had four passing touchdowns and one rushing touchdown for his playoff bound Whitefish. Polson scored 34 points on the day. I'll do the math real quick. That means he accounted for all of the Polson points. So when you do that versus a playoff bound team, in my opinion, it kind of makes it that much more spectacular. He added 118 yards rushing on the ground. He threw for 196. He had the five total scores. Just a flat out playmaker. Polson gets the bye and definitely well worthy of, I believe, his second prep player of the week nod. All right. Last up. We got another group nod. We've done this a couple times, but we're going to shout out the big boys, the Glacier Wolfpack offensive line after helping clear the way for the Wolfpack to pile up over 600 total yards in double digit offensive touchdowns. That is rare in football, especially in high school football when there's not a lot of time on the clock and the clock's moving quite a bit. 600 total yards, double digit offensive touchdowns. Here's a quote from Glacier head coach Grady Bennett on the offensive line. Gosh, that offensive line just keeps getting better. Rush for 300, throw for 300. I'm really happy with the front play. Here's another quote. This was via Glacier running back Cash Gochea a few weeks ago after the Wolfpack knocked off Butte in reference to the offensive line. Quote, Henry Sellers, Ryan Heil, Ben Winters. They did a great job. And then Gage Slider, quarterback of the Wolfpack, added this about the offensive line after that Butte game. The big boys up front, they battled tonight. Shout out to those boys. They really competed and played a great game. I bring the quotes up because this isn't the first time Glacier has credited their offensive line for playing a major role in their success. So you got to give those guys credit because when you watch an offense like Glacier, who really does go through the progression, Slider takes his time. He reads the defense. Their running backs... They make that cut or two before they go downhill. They are patient, and that is, has a lot to do with your offensive line really setting the tone. I mean, we just talked about er, a few seconds ago, Columbia Falls soccer goalie Bryce Dunham. Offensive line, goalie, there's a lot of similarities there in the sense if they do their job correctly, everybody around them gets better just having that confidence instilled because it makes the game that much easier. So a lot of credit to that offensive line. A lot of credit to the goalie. Maybe they don't always get the love, but they're a big reason for the success, and we see it time in, or time out, time in. All right, whatever. We see it all the time. I'm pumped up. Former offensive lineman here a little bit. And, hey, we got to give the old line some credit. I mean, it's rare that a team can put up 600 total yards in a game and score 10 touchdowns. At the end of the day, I could go out there and run through those lanes, and I, you know, I can't even – okay, I'm going to cut that out. Just kidding. Let's move it along to a big thank you 
to the Hagedome Media Group Montana for presenting this week's Prep Players of the Week. Reminder, the team in Montana is here to help you grow. Our skilled team will assess your marketing goals and craft ROI-focused campaigns home to meet your business needs. Our integrated marketing solutions will help your people find you wherever they are looking, whether it's Google, YouTube, apps, or your local newspaper. Contact Anton at 406 758 44 one oh for more information that's 406-758-4410 all right last up it's time to get into the college ranks we're gonna talk a little bobcats talk a little grizzlies let's start out with montana state who just won their fcs leading 17th straight home game in a crazy game over weber state they saw weber state set the fcs record for most safeties in a game with four that totaled eight points for the Bobcats, and the Bobcats won 43-38. to 38. So those safeties pretty much won the game for the Bobcats. The Weber State safe, uh, safeties all came as a result of the long snapper snapping the ball over the punter's head and into the end zone or out of the back of the end zone. So it's pretty much eight free points. That being said, the Bobcats did do some work to get the W. The Butte legend Touchdown Tommy Malott was extremely impressive. He rushed for a Big Sky Conference record and Montana State record when it comes to quarterbacks, 273 yards. So when you're setting records, you're getting the W, you know the kid has a different gear. By the way, the Weber State Wildcats were undefeated coming into this one, and the Bobcats found the way to win without Sean Chambers, who has emerged as one of the best offensive players in the country at the FCS level. I think once Sean Chambers is back to full health and the way Malott looked, I mean, they are going to be dangerous offensively. Some other Bobcat news. What a weekend last last weekend in the NFL. Troy Anderson racked up 13 tackles in his first ever start Sunday for the Falcons. And Alex Singleton of the Broncos followed that up with a blackjack on Monday Night Football. 21 total tackles, 19 solo tackles. And check this out. Singleton's 19 solo tackles is the second most in a single game in NFL history. Very impressive. As for the 21 solo t- or total tackles, that mark is tied with NFL legends Zach Thomas, Rodney Harrison, and London Fletcher for the fourth most in a single game all time. Those guys were some of the best defenders and tackling machines of the early 2000s. Also, a couple other guys tied there as well, but those were the big notable names. So epic company for Singleton. And what a performance on Monday Night Football. And then Anderson had a great game Sunday last week. So it just kind of just highlights the level of college football being played right here in the state of Montana. Very impressive, special stuff. All right. One other Bobcat note we're sharing. Montana State standout and former Bozeman Hawk Callahan O'Reilly was actually added to the watch list for the Buck Buchanan Award, honoring the top defensive player at the FCS level, joining Cal Spell's own former Glacier High product and current Grizz standout Patrick O'Connell to make that award race just a little bit more interesting as now we have a Bobcat and a Grizz both chasing the hardware. Sean Chambers was also added to the a watch list himself, added to the Walter Payton Award, given to the best offensive player at the FCS level, joining... Tommy Malat, who was a preseason addition. So now the Bobcats quarterback room features two of the best offensive players in the nation at the FCS level. It's going to be impressive, and it's going to be scary to watch down the stretch. Let's get into that Grizz game, though, because we have that conversation with Fritz Neighbor to get to. We're going to talk some Grizz. We're going to talk some Bobcats and some Big Sky. So a lot, a lot to left to get to when it comes to the college ranks. But the Bobcats right now, a lot of good news coming out of there. They, they're have the FCS record home leading streak. They got their guys playing well on, you know, Monday night football and they got the win with Malat setting record. So it was a good week, you know, and, and, you know, I, I keep it unbiased here. You know, I, I don't lean either way. You know, I'm, I'm going root for the Grizz. I'm root for the cats. I, I wish them both success at the end of the day though. I mean, that was an impressive week. So let's jump into the Grizz stuff. And, you know, I don't want to make Grizz fans totally relive this tough, tough, Weekend of football they went through. The Grizz led for almost the entire game until Sac State tied it with less than three minutes in the fourth. And then the Hornets took their first lead in overtime at 12.39 a.m. Mountain Time. So no excuses. But this is what I want to say. The Grizzlies are coming off a loss. They went on the road playing in a very unusual time time slot. It was prime time. It was ESPN2. It's a big game. Got the nation watching. It's unorthodox. And at the end of the day, they went out there and did their thing for almost 
they almost got the job done. It was a heartbreaker. And almost the entire regulation, they were in control of that football game. And just it was just a little, just not enough. Just not enough, right? But here's the thing. Like I said, you're playing in an unusual time slot. Your backup quarterback came in for major action. Lucas Johnson had the Grizz rolling in that game before he took that helmet-to-helmet shot that resulted in the Sac State defender being tossed. I have to imagine if Johnson stays in that game, we have a different outcome. Now, Chris Brown, he was solid in relief, but Johnson gives him that dynamic element. And look, the Grizzlies, they got back to the run game. Osmo, he carried the ball. Nick Osmo carried the ball 20 times for 72 yards and a touchdown. Marcus Knight carried it 22 times for 61 yards and a touchdown. Maybe not the most efficient rushing numbers. They got the ground game going. Johnson was rolling early. They had this game. They, in my opinion, I come out of this game with less questions than heading into it. I had got answers from this Grizzlies team because that's a tough game to win. In Big Sky play, Sacramento State, since their coach took over, has lost just one game. So this was no easy opponent. They're one of the best FCS teams in the country. You're on the road in an unusual time slot with your backup quarterback. And here's what really made the rounds all over Twitter. There was a very questionable call late where a Sac State receiver may have had a foot on the line. And after they reviewed it, they kept the play and kept it a catch. And that set up kind of the end of it for the Grizz as far as getting the win. From all the angles I saw, and like I said, trying to keep it unbiased here, I saw a foot on the line. That shouldn't have been a catch. That one should have been coming back. Now, that being said, I think the Grizzlies coaching staff is going to be upset with that. I do. But you have to think they missed two field goals in the second quarter. And they had a really hard time stopping running quarterback Asher O'Hare of the Hornets. I mean, he, he rushed 13 times for 56 yards and two touchdowns. I mean, you got to think with Tommy Malott and Sean Chambers coming up, we just mentioned Malott just set the big sky record for rushing yards by a quarterback in a game. You got to think the Grizzlies are going to have to make some adjustments to either get a QB spy going, alter a couple of things, because they're going to have to really minimize that Bobcats rushing attack later this year if they want to keep it close in that one. And I think the Grizzlies defense has the key players to do that without a doubt. They have the speed, they have the athleticism. But my big point, I guess, is this can be a, a learning experience. I thought they responded well after the Idaho loss. They're on the road. You want to win that game. You led the entire duration of regulation. But your run game was rolling. The Hornets' high-flying offense never really got it going. And I, like I said, if Lucas Johnson doesn't get hurt, I think the Grizz probably rolled to a victory in that game. He can't play the what-if game, but he was grooving. So my big point here is I don't think the Grizzlies need to panic. Grizz Nation, no need to panic. I think if this was the FBS and only four teams made the playoffs, it would be a little bit different story. But we're in the FCS right now talking, and there's plenty of room to make that tournament. So the Grizz need to focus on preparing for Weber State. They need to prepare for Cal Poly and Eastern Washington coming up. And those two games, if I'm the Grizzlies, I'm circling both those games and saying, let's go win both those by 40 Let's prove a point. Let's get our momentum going as they head to Bozeman November 19th for the Brawl of the Wild with Montana State because that game is is leading up to being very crucial to the Big Sky Conference Championship, the way the Bobcats are playing, and the Grizz, they're still hanging around. It can unravel down the stretch, and they could easily be sitting there with a shot at the Conference Championship if a couple teams lose down the stretch. So that game's going to be even have some extra weight on it Playoff implications, big sky implications. Point being, the Grizzlies can take this loss versus Sacramento State. They can learn from it. They can watch the film, and they can understand, look, this is what we did right. This is what we did wrong. Our running game did get going. Johnson went healthy, had us rolling. The big thing is let's stop those mobile quarterbacks. Let's prepare for a guy like a Tommy Mallott, a Sean Chambers, because when they come, you know, when they come up on the film, it's going to look a lot like Asher O'Hara was doing for Sacramento Hornets. So that's just, you know, that was my big takeaway. I was, I'm not going to lie. I watched the Bobcats game in the daytime and I stayed up till one in the morning watching the Grizzlies game. And I spent most of the day sweating. So I'll just leave it there. I won't go into too much detail, but it was like a nerve wracking day of a Montana sports fan between those two games. The Weber state Montana state game was just a grinder. And then, the Grizzlies made you sweat it out all night. I really thought they had it until the last second. It was just a crazy day of football. 
real quick, some Grizz news worth cheering for, and then we will get into that conversation with Fritz Neighbor. We kind of just talk some general Grizzly stuff, a little bit of their loss, some Grizz legends, stuff like that, just fun stuff. But here's something worth cheering for. Former Glacier Wolfpack punter Patrick Rohrbach was added to the Jerry Rice Award watch list for the nation's top freshman in the FCS division. The Glacier High product joins, joins former Grizzlies Jerry Lou McGee, Gresh Jensen, and Robbie Houck to become the fourth Grizzly to play his way onto the Jerry Rice watch list. So the award's now in its 12th year. Just real quick, I'll run through a couple guys who have won the Jerry Rice Award just to show the company that Rohrbach's guy's name next to. Cooper Cup just came off winning the Super Bowl, had 145 catches, 1,947 yards, and 16 receiving touchdowns last year for the Super Bowl champion Los Angeles Rams. And those were in one season, all those stats. So just having your name next to a guy like that, pretty dang impressive. Trey Lance also won the award, who was a number three overall pick in the NFL, was set to start for the Niners this year, but got hurt. And Chase Edmonds, who attended Fordham, He's the Miami Dolphins running back right now. He's in a bit of a running back by committee. But the point being, it's a very, very special company. Very impressive. Shout out to the former Glacier Wolfpack punter for making his way onto that list. All right, y'all. This show was just one of those ones. State title action, playoff action, prep scores. They were 84 to 15. I mean, it was, it was one of those weeks where the sports world was crazy. Like I said, I was watching Montana State football from – you know, Montana, let me say this. I was watching football in the state of Montana from about noon till about midnight or 1 p.m., 1 a.m. the other night. I'm still rattled. I can't even talk. Just a jam-packed week. Let's get to that conversation with Fritz to wrap this show up. I mentioned it before. Fritz is the walking encyclopedia of Montana sports knowledge. It's really great to have him on the show talking some football. Hope you guys enjoy it. Make sure to follow Fritz at Fritz underscore neighbor on Twitter. And like I mentioned before, make sure you're following the Daily Interlake on Twitter at Daily Interlake on Twitter. All right, here's that conversation. Hope you enjoy. All right, I'm joined with Fritz Neighbor of the Daily Interlake. Going to talk a little Grizzlies, some big Sky Conference. Going to get into the college football talk. All right, Fritz, just to kind of jump into it, Montana, the Grizzlies are coming off their first loss of the year versus the Idaho Vandals. I know that was a a game the Grizzlies really wanted to win. They wanted to keep that undefeated season going. The fans are riled up about that one. But I know had some real playmakers on both sides of the ball. And that QB, Giovanni McCoy, looks like a real problem moving forward for the big sky. So I just wanted to ask you, you were in person watching the game. How much of that loss was the Grizzlies' mistakes versus the Vandals are just a really good football team? Well, I think Idaho came in underrated. I, I kind of started having a funny feeling about the Vandals as I uh, was typing up the Big Sky Capsules last week. And uh, that quarterback was coming in, completing over 70%, completed 78% or 76% against the Grizz. He's, uh, he's not very big, but he's mobile. He's got a great arm. They, they hit underneath passes all day, and then he had the home run when they needed it. Um, I'd kind of forgotten about uh, the Hatton kid, mm -hmm. all Big Sky two years ago, and uh, was hurt. So he kind of came back in a big way. That gave him a a second big play guy on the outside. The um, thing that struck me is uh, Montana's offense was kind of stuck in the mud. Idaho's defense had six FBS transfers, one from Notre Dame. The linebacker made that made a critical interception. Um, Idaho reloaded. They're just they're just pretty much loaded, and uh, Montana's offense wasn't ready. Seemed a little disjointed. I think Marcus Knight deserves more carries. I don't think I'm alone in that. He had two for 11 yards in the second half. They, they get a first down. They punt three plays later. And uh, I don't think he saw the ball the rest of the game. There's just a lot of things went wrong and coupled that with a, a good Idaho squad, and it's an L. Yeah, I think that's well said, and I agree. Idaho, when I checked out your capsules and started looking at them a little bit more, noticed all the transfers, how efficient their quarterback was, and a against a team like the Grizzlies, who this year when I've watched them, it's their pass rush has been dangerous. When you can get rid of the ball quick, it makes it tough for those guys to do their job. So, no, the Vandals do deserve a lot of credit, and I just thought I'd get your opinion on that. You, you just mentioned it kind of. Next thing I wanted to jump to, it did feel like the running back by committee has been going. I have the stats here. Xavier Harris has 246 yards on 42 carries. Nick Osmo has 49 carries for 230 yards. And Knight, who you just mentioned, has 39 carries for 205 yards. Harris and Osmo both have one rushing touchdown. Knight has three. So it does feel like maybe they need to 
kind of get one guy going, find that bell cow, because a lot of the times when you're rolling, the running back by committee is nice, but when it gets tough, you kind of need that guy who could grind it out. You did mention Knight just now. Do you see him as the guy who maybe could take the leap, or does anybody else come to mind as that go-to guy down the stretch? Well, you know, all three get downhill. Xavier's more of the really mobile, uh, make the cut, make a guy miss kind of guy. Shifty, yeah. But Knight's the one that's really got downhill, and, you know, three years ago, uh, pre-pandemic and pre-knee surgery, he had 23 touchdowns. He's just a talented kid. He's, now he's back, bigger, stronger. He looks nimble, looks recovered to me. Um, I asked Bobby a little bit, Bobby Hawk, mm-hmm. a little bit about the identity of the team because, uh, you know, in his previous tenure, he did have a bell cow. He had Lex Hilliard, who was a flathead high graduate. He had Chase Reynolds. Uh, tied to those two guys was a lot of Grizz success because he was giving these guys – one guy, 20, 25, sometimes 30 carries. He famously told me once that Chase Reynolds would be a never never be a 25-carry guy. Mm. Three weeks later, he had 38 carries against Portland State. So I am not sure about what the identity is. I know they're more up-tempo than they ever used to be. Um, maybe that's not Bobby's style. Maybe there's still some, some adjusting to make. But all of a sudden, they're, they're looking up at like three, four teams ahead of them in the Big Sky Conference standings, including Saturday's foe, Sac State. So... Yeah, and that's going to be the big one on the horizon there. And, yeah, I think there, there's great points there. With When you do have that guy, it sounds like in the past, and I know both those guys you mentioned went on to play in the pros, when you have that guy who could break down a defense and then let a running back find a rhythm, because sometimes, you know, it's, it's like anything. It's hard to do a short burst, you're out of the game, get in that groove. So, yeah, maybe they will find that guy. And you kind of just mentioned it, but I noticed Montana it did feel like early on a lot of passing on first and second down, a lot of – ended up in third and long situations. It kind of felt like all those home runs that worked early in the season, now that they're playing a little steeper competition, maybe got to get back to hitting the singles, kind of taking what the defense gives you. And you did touch on that, but just kind of want to hear your thoughts on if maybe getting back to the basics could help that team. Yeah, I mean, I if I had a nickel for uh, every time in the 2000s that uh, Montana had first and goal and gave up the ball and downs, trying to get a score touchdown on the ground, I'd have a lot of nickels. <laughs> Didn't really matter then because the big sky was uh, not as good as it is now. Not as good, not as deep. Uh, I mentioned Idaho's speed. That made a big difference. I think maybe the disguise coverages. Very true. And, uh, you know, that led Lucas Johnson to say, okay, we're going we're gonna to throw on this defensive look and then uh, couldn't, get, couldn't get the open man. The thing that struck me about that game, and um, I mentioned it, I think, in my, in my game story, was that uh, – you know, Idaho had terrible first downs. Uh, they had a lot of second 11s. A lot of second longs didn't seem to bother the Vandals at all. They just kept uh, plugging away and holding the ball for big chunks of time. And uh, when the Grizz were 2, you know, 2 and 10, 3rd and 10, uh, you just didn't get the same feeling. They just seemed kind of uh, off stride, and it never changed hardly the whole game. Yeah, that's, that's kind of – I actually kind of brought that up in the last podcast just a little in the sense – it felt like the Grizzlies' defense kept getting stuck in those long third downs. They couldn't get the defense off the field, and it wasn't the defense's fault because they made a lot of plays. But at a certain point when you're on the field for that many plays with a quarterback like that, third and long, they're just converting, starts so wearing down the defense. So, no, it, it, it did feel like that. It was just – and we kind of talked about it earlier, but Idaho does deserve a lot of credit. Well, uh, if there's anything else, Grizz, you wanted to mention, we can get to that. If not, I had a couple – just a little Bobcats thing and then one more other Big Sky uh, question. No, let's move on. Oh, yeah. You know what? I did have another Grizz thing. We'll actually jump to that. That was my fault. I'm getting too excited here. Good good stuff so far. But I did want to ask, speaking of that Grizzlies defense, good timing. We talked earlier, Lucas Johnson, he's been a really, you know, he had a kind of a lackluster performance last week. But he's been a really exciting playmaking QB. So we talked some of the best playmaking QBs the Grizz have had. So now with Patrick O'Connell, Justin Ford tearing it up at linebacker and corner, I wanted to ask, who are kind of some of the best pass rushers you've seen or just in Grizz history as, long, as well as lockdown corners, just to kind of credit those players for what they're doing now and just reference the past? Yeah, you know, O'Connell's possibly the best I've seen. He's just uh, another, another one of those walk-ons that makes good for the Grizz. Um, I think he's up to 7.5 sacks this season. Um, I think he, I'm pretty sure he's going to win the Buchanan Award, which goes to the best defensive player in the FCS. The thing with uh, his position, it's it's been kind of the linebacker U, rush end U at U- University of Montana. Seen a, quite a few guys going back to um, before Croy Beerman, who was our first, I shouldn't say our, 
going back to Corey Berryman, who was Montana's first Buchanan Award winner, mm -hmm. he played the same way in the same, same position, basically, that uh, Patrick does right now. Um, just a huge talent out of Harden. And, and he went on to success with, was it the Falcons, I believe? Yeah, yeah I do quite remember a few that. Years with the Falcons, did a lot of the same things he did. Did with the Grizz, you know, stripping the ball from the quarterback. Um, wreaking havoc. Yeah, that's what O'Connell does, yeah. Yeah, he wasn't – Bierman was maybe, you know, 15 pounds away from being an all-pro every year. But he was really pretty dynamic, pretty uh, – what's the word I'm looking for? Productive mm -hmm. NFL rush end for a lot of seasons. Of course, some people may know him from uh, Housewives and Don't Be Tardy, but – he was a good football player. I wasn't too. aware of that, but that's funny how that works out with some guys post career. All of a sudden, they get a bigger impact for that kind of stuff. Too funny, but no, I, yeah, I thought I would ask. And you know, he's a guy who I don't want to jinx anything, but if he has some good workouts in, in the off season, who knows? He might be playing on Sundays one day. O'Connell, because he just has that motor, and I feel like you can't teach that. And like you walk on kid, chip on the shoulder, it all shows. And then as far as corners go, is has there been anybody that's kind of? I know Ford's been really locked down. Has there been anybody who comes to mind kind of on that level or close to it? You know, the guy that comes up to mind right away is Truman Johnson, who had a pretty good NFL career. Mm -hmm. I, th um, I thought that's where it would go. Be before that, uh, Tough Harris had a cold strip, was a really good corner for the Grizz. Got a little bit of a cup of coffee in the NFL. Uh, Truman was great. Um, and then, uh, you know, Justin Ford, I'm going to show my age here. It's kind of the Louis Wright deal with him. I saw a graphic where people have thrown at him seven times all season in six games and completed three. You know, last year he was picking off a pass like in eight straight games, I think, or seven. Uh, this year he hasn't had very many opportunities just because people are staying away from him for the most part. Yeah. So, um, don't judge him by his stats. He's a great player, and I think he'll play at the next level. I, I've been thinking that too, and just to make another comparison, there was that Sauce Gardner out of Cincinnati last year, and I think it was similar where his numbers were just insane as far as they just won't even throw at them, shut everybody down. If you looked at the stats, you're like, oh, this guy's all right. But, no, there's something to that. There's a knack for locking guys down and playing with physicality, and that Ford has it. So, no, good stuff. Real quick, as far as Montana State goes, I've been watching them just a little bit, keeping up with now that Tommy Malott's back. They got Sean Chambers. What, what are your thoughts on kind of their dual quarterback approach and how much of a problem that could be for FCS teams moving forward? Oh, it's clearly a big problem. I mean, they're 6-1. They're and one. They scored against Oregon State. They scored 28 points. A lot ran for over 100 yards against a Pac-12 team. Um, he got the concussion at Eastern. Um, I was maybe a little bit surprised. I mean, I know there's a kind of a, a rule that you don't lose your starting position via injury. But when he got cleared to play, Brent Vegan, the MSU coach, instantly said, he'll start. And he started, and I think he had a couple bad throws early, but he wound up 16 for 20 passing. Um, I think people – don't respect his passing enough. I know MSU runs a lot of fades. They throw them all day. But that's a hard pass to throw, and, uh, and Malat does it. And then Sean Chambers, you know, is the guy that takes over inside the 20. He's got about 30 pounds on Malat. It uh, seems to be the wave of the future. The Grizz aren't there yet, but, you know, look who's at the top of the big sky with one conference loss in three seasons at Sac State, and their two-man crew at quarterback is – there's none better. MSU's coming pretty close, but – Watch Saturday. Yeah, that thunder and lightning approach. And I, I was surprised, too. I, I kept notice of that where Malak got the job back right off the bat. I, I kind of – at first I was surprised because I'm like, Chambers playing out of his mind. But I guess having that championship success, maybe the coach is like, look, we'll balance out. But I was surprised, too, and that was something I was totally keeping an eye on because I'm like, where do you go? I mean, that's a, it's a good problem to have. But it was an interesting one because a lot of the times when a dude's rolling – you just stick with it. But, uh, yeah, it's, I think that dual QB thing is going to be nice. And I, so far it's, it seems like it's working, but they're going to get some real tests now with Weber State in moving forward. So we're going to see how they react to that. Last question, Big Sky standings, extremely tight right now. We, we've been talking about it all show how much the competitions rose in the last few years. But both the Montana schools, Weber State, Sac State, and the Idaho Vandals, all FCS top 25 I just kind of wanted to get your thoughts. How many teams do you see from the Big Sky making the playoffs down the stretch and, if possible, what teams? But just kind of a ballpark guess. Well, I think, um, you know, Montana, as long as it doesn't lose a fourth game, will get in. I think uh, last – well, I know last year the Big Sky got five teams in. I think it will be the same this year. It's a, it's a great league. Um, I was shocked last year when Sac State got a home game and lost. But uh, they'll be back. Weaver State's loaded. 
Montana, Montana State, and I think Idaho, as long as they keep rolling like they are, they're in. Yeah. So that's five. I, th- I think it'll happen. Yeah, no, I mean, I, that sounds about right. That's kind of what my gut was feeling. And when you have that many good teams, you just see the competition rise. You know, people want to play to each other's level, and it just feels like that's what's happening right down the stretch, moving into the playoffs. I mean, these big sky teams, we saw it last year with Montana State. I think they're going to be prepared for the playoffs. So it's been fun to watch. Thank you, Fritz, for your time. If there's anything else you'd like to throw out there, uh, go for it. If not, thank you. Well, I still wanted to talk a little bit about the playoffs just because. Yeah, yeah, throw it out Mon- there. If Montana goes 7-4, to four, there's 24 teams that make it. Okay. So it's, it's a huge bracket. Might even get bigger, which I think is a mistake. So 24 teams, that means eight teams get a bye. If Montana's 7-4, to it'll be hard for the NCAA not to give them a home game Thanksgiving weekend. Because they'll make money. They make money for the NCAA. They're one of the few programs that does. So, yeah. Yeah, and that would be a big, big thing. Thanksgiving weekend playoff game. That'd be a lot of fun. But we'll see. Who knows? It, I mean, it's gonna. It's one of those things. I guess time will just tell. We'll just see how they played it, play it down the stretch. And it's gonna be fun because, like we just said, the competition's there. So I'm excited and. Yeah, I th- I'm excited for the FCS playoffs. It has a little bit of that tournament feel. It's kind of what the FBS is hoping for, so we'll, we'll see how it goes. Yeah, I, I could wind up in Missoula for a month. Who knows? Yeah, right? You might. Hey, it's, a, it, it's one of those things. We'll see what happens, but maybe it'll happen. Reel off a few wins, and there we go. That, I mean, that's how it goes in football. Get the hot hand late. We've seen it in the NFL. We've seen it in college. It happens time and time again. So maybe that loss came at the right time. And, uh, yeah, on that note, if there's anything else, Fritz, great stuff today. And um, if not, we'll close it up there. We're good. Yeah, awesome. I know, always good to get some Grizz talking. Thank you, and we'll get back to the show. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Before we wrap this thing up, thanks again to Fritz. And I want to give a special thanks to Hagano Media Group Montana for their support and remind everyone listening that this episode was brought to you by Nomad. Voted to the Flathead's best manufacturer, Nomad is a longtime supporter of the local community and sports scene. So bring 20 years of building great careers and mission-focused custom vehicles. Nomad, a Montana-based company making a global impact. Nomad has worked with NASA and various branches of the United States military. So you know Nomad is a name you can trust with your manufacturing needs. For more info, visit www.nomadgcs.com. That's www.nomadgcs.com. All right, what a show, everyone. Next week, we'll be checking in on how the Grizz respond after back-to-back losses. The Bobcats are on a bye week, so we'll take a little bit of a broader look at the big sky and some Bobcat stuff. Plus, we have a huge week of prep playoff football action to recap, and we'll check in on our local soccer teams competing for the state titles. And as always, we'll get to those prep players of the week. That'll do it for today's show. Thanks again to the Flathead's best manufacturer, Nomad, and Hagado Media Group, Montana. Thanks as always, y'all. I'm Josh Dugan, and that'll do it for the Interlake Sports Now. Till next time.